So uh, this is the a story of Elsa. Uh, not that Elsa, uh, who most of you probably know. But this story <laughs> starts actually um, back on Monday, July 7th, 1.13 AM. I was with my best friend, Liam, uh, and our new friend, Elsa, in Elat, Israel. I turned to Elsa as we were walking down the boardwalk, and I said, when we reach the middle of the bridge, I'm going to strip down to my underwear. I'm going to pass my things to Liam, and I think you should do the same. After three days of traveling with us, she was used to our antics. So standing there in our underwear, I grabbed her by the hand. We climbed over the safety railing and jumped. To even begin to understand how crazy this entire scenario is, we have to go back to my eighth grade year. You see, my school teacher walks in and says, we're redoing the seating chart. Everybody gets to pick two people they don't want to sit down next to and tell me privately. <laughs> I discover two things, unfortunately. One is, there's one student nobody wants to sit with. The second, I'm that student. <laughs> I was heartbroken. I was a social outcast. But what I lacked in social skills, I more than made up for with my love of science. I figured science could give me the answers to popularity and living an exciting life. So I turned to my favorite academic, Dr. Henry Walton Jones Jr. He's my favorite professor by far. You probably know him as Indiana Jones. <laughs> and of course, his fellow doctor, who? And uh, the brilliant son of uh, Katie and Tom Bueller, Ferris. And with them as my guides, I would go forth and study the science of adventure. Now, people would tell me the beauty of adventure is that it happens by chance, that it's completely unpredictable. But if that were true, if it was just random, all of us would live similarly exciting lives, and we don't, which means that there has to be a method to the madness. Some people live quiet lives and like to stay at home. Others are thrill seekers, and if we could understand what inspires them and what they do, we could model it and learn from it. And so that's what I did. I spent years collecting research by the top minds on human behavior science. And then I went out and actually tested it to see how it would affect us in the real world. So that's what brought me to Nice, an experiment of mine. I wanted to understand the paradox of choice. What do constraints provide us by limiting options? So I dropped myself off with no place to stay, I didn't speak the language, didn't know anybody in the train. The last train had left. Either I would convince a stranger to put me up for the night, or I would sleep on the street. By 2 AM, I was convinced that the cobblestones of Nice would be my bed. <laughs> I'm not sure either. <laughs> so, but in a last ditch effort, I befriended a group of Brits. And somehow, by 4 o'clock in the morning, I was staying in a three-story chateau on the border of Monaco in my own room. But let me be honest, most of my experiments did not end that well <laughs> at all. July 7, <laughs> 2013, Pamplona, Spain. This time, I wanted to understand the difference between perceived risk and peril. <laughs> so after making it through the run just fine and pumped full of adrenaline, I decide I'm going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bulls. That's an actual photo. You see, the bull missed its jump and landed on my back. I thought I was paralyzed. It turned out, this is me writhing in pain in the hospital, um, that is a hoof print embedded into my shoulder. My, uh, I, I still, six months of uh, physical therapy, I still suffer from back pain on occasion. But in the process of countless experiments, what I discovered was something extraordinary that I call the epic model for adventure. Every adventure follows a predictable four-stage process that makes life exciting. So what is it? Stage one, establish. You have to put the right elements in place so that anything can happen. The most important of which by far is the right people and a new location. Your brain actually operates differently in new environments. This is exactly what brought me and my best friend Liam to Stockholm. And this is how we met our bridge jumping friend, Elsa. 5.17 a.m. July 3rd, 2014, we're going through duty-free, picking up a few gifts as we go to Israel. As we get to the counter, the charming girl behind it asks for my plane ticket. 
Oh, Israel, she, she says. Yeah, do you want to come, I respond. Yeah, she says. I say, great, then come. She says, well, I'm a grad student, and it's really expensive. I say, well, what if I paid for your trip? She sat there contemplating. I could see her doing battle with that conversation in her head. Saying yes could be exciting, but it could be dangerous. Who are these people? Saying no would be the safe bet. The silence was now getting awkwardly long, and I could only think I was coming off as creepy. <laughs> and then a smile started to appear on her face, and I realized that an ordinary life was not in the cards for her. She said yes. The next moment, I had my phone out, looking for matching flights. Within 25 minutes on her next break, we were booking a ticket for a woman I only later found out. Her name was Elsa. <laughs> Stage two, push boundaries. In order for an experience to be an adventure, you have to cross some kind of social, physical, or emotional boundary. You have to grow from it. And sitting at my parents' home in Israel, waiting for Elsa to arrive, <laughs> I was crossing all three. I was freaking out, wondering who I invited to spend time with my family. Because she could be either the coolest person I've ever met or the craziest. But luckily, when she arrived, she managed to charm my very confused family. And they couldn't have been happier that she came. Stage three, increase. You have to maximize the emotional value from the environment that you're in. On the third day of our trip, we're in a lot. Liam and I walk into Elsa's room, and she's sitting on the floor crying. She confides in us that her father is dying of ALS, and that he had just been put back in the hospital. The biggest reason for her accepting the trip was that for years, she had spent all of her time taking care of her dad with her mom. And this was her first break to do something for herself. Now, Liam and I had no idea. We couldn't do anything for her dad or that situation. But what we could do is make sure that the rest of the trip was magic. And so, next stop, the bridge in Elat. <laughs> when we hit the water, we had to climb up the rocks past the now large crowd of people who were staring at these insane people in their underwear, push past them, run to the far side of the boardwalk, and put on our clothes before the police caught us. Now Elsa, covered in dirt, hair messy as it's ever been, was a new woman, excited and energized by the experience of pushing her boundaries. You see, that's the gift of an adventure. Sure, you come out with amazing stories, but because you had to grow and push your boundaries, you become a new person in the process one distinct from that who started. Stage four, continue. You pick where to go next and how to get there. And if you do go somewhere else, you loop back through the process. Or you end with style. Not that kind of style. There's a quirk of human behavior called the peak end rule, discovered by Nobel laureate Dan Kahneman. We don't process the duration of pleasure or pain. We only notice the peaks of an experience and how they end. And that's why it's so critical to end on a positive note. You see, on the last day of her trip, Elsa was getting into a cab to go to the airport. And she turned to me and she says, John, you could have chosen anyone uh, to come. Why'd you choose me? And I smiled at her. She was so sweet. I said, Elsa, the simple answer is that you said yes. But the real answer is nobody says yes. Everybody talks about experiencing life, but nobody's willing to go to battle with that conversation in their head in order to actually do that. And when you meet somebody who's willing to do that, you have to do anything you can to spend time with them. You see, you have it backwards. I didn't choose you. I'm just a madman who invited you. You said yes to me. So I have to ask you, why'd you choose me? She started tearing up. She was so overwhelmed, all she could do was hug me. And she got into her cab. And like that, she was gone. I have to say, of all of my travels, 
of all the, the gifts I've ever gotten and things I've gotten at Duty Free, the best by far was Elsa. <laughs> so I leave you with this. The scope of our life is in direct proportion to how uncomfortable we're willing to be. You have to be willing to go to battle with that conversation in your head. And so, I wish you all an incredibly uncomfortable life <laughs> and all the gifts that come with it. Thank you.